Hello, this is Mr. White and this video is on the half angle identities. For starters, a, a real quick family tree here. Uh, once we got past the fundamental identities, you know, the Pythagorean identities, the co-function identities, the um, even odd identities, the reciprocal and quotient identities, once we got, we got past those fundamental identities, we introduced the sum and difference identities. And we realized that once we practiced that and got used to those, when we pro plug the same variable in for both A and B into these formulas, that is what gave us the double angle identities. And then we played around with those a little bit and got comfortable with those. And we realized that when we took the cosine version, those, those several different versions of the cosine double angle identities, and when we algebraically rearranged those and substituted in uh, one variable for another, that is what gave us these half angle identities. So I'm not going to go into any more detail than that as far as the, the history or the family tree here, but I just wanted to remind you that those are all interconnected. These uh, sum and difference, um, double angle, half angle, they're all interconnected, they're all related to each other. And I think the, the um, diligent math student is going to want to remind themselves and reinforce that interconnectedness. But let's go ahead and get to examples here for the half angle identities. Uh, first example, solve on the interval from 0 to 2 pi. And we've got an equation here in front of us. And this is one where every year it kind of breaks my heart how many students miss this big, wonderful gift that has been presented to us here in this example. And the gift that I'm referring to is the fact that the half angle trig function in question is being squared. That makes our life a lot easier. Uh, I'll remind you that when you're looking at a problem like this, rather than get distracted by what's going on over here, you want to zoom right in on the expression that has the half angle, and you want to address that right away, no exceptions. So this is the half angle identity in question, sine of u over 2 in this case is equal to, well, you see it right there in front of you. And I want to remind you that when we are looking at the uh, equation in front of you, the problem in front of us, we can think of that. You don't, you don't have to write this down, but if it helps you do so, we can at least think of it or write it as such. Now, the way it was presented to us, that's how you're typically going to see it in books, and that's how I'm going to typically write it, but at least think of it in this way, and that should really make it clear to you what we plug in. Again, this is a, a source of confusion that I see in students every year, and I'm, I'm never quite exactly sure what they're thinking that makes them do all sorts of crazy things. But this is the correct thing to do. Take out the sine of x over 2, that's on one side of our formula, and just plug in the other side. It's really as simple as that. And if you don't see it already, you, you really see the gift that I was talking about here, why we're so thankful that that expression is being squared. Uh, that square is going to take care of, and again, this is the square I'm talking about, that's going to not only get rid of this square root here, it's also going to take care of this plus or minus. We're not going to have to worry about it when we square. Okay? So that's the gift. Don't you be one of those students who overlooks it. Uh, let me go ahead and clear up a little space here. I haven't done anything to the left side, so I'll just leave that alone. And now on the right side, I've got four, and again, looking at everything that's uh, canceled each other out, four times quantity, one minus cosine x, all over 2. Uh, let me go ahead and bring down the, the left side here. 5 cosine squared x minus 1. And things are looking a little bit better here. We, we still have some work to do. But at least we got rid of the radical and the plus or minus. So let's proceed. I'm going to recognize that 4 divided by 2 is just 2. So I can take that 2 and distribute it to this expression, 1 minus cosine x. Let's go ahead and do that. That's going to give me 2. And again, I said distribute. It goes to both terms, right? So 2 minus 2 cosine x. And again, I'm just leaving the left side alone. It's just waiting patiently, waiting for stuff to shake out. And by now, we definitely should be at the point where we are instantly recognizing that as a quadratic. That is a quadratic equation. Let's go ahead and shuffle this around, get everything to one side, and put it in the preferred order. Uh, let's Put it in the quadratic term first, 5 cosine squared x. Uh, let's do the linear term next. So I'm going to take this negative 2 cosine x on the right, 
Move it over to the left side, in which case it becomes plus 2 cosine x. And then I'm going to say, okay, this minus 1 on the left side, I'm also going to subtract this 2 over. So that's going to give me minus 3 equals 0. Don't forget to put the equals 0. For some reason, students every year, once they get 0 on one side of the equation, they think they don't have to write equals 0. That's an important part of the equation. It's really not an equation if you don't have an equal sign and something on the other side of the equal sign. All right, so here's the point where we cross our fingers. And I'll go ahead and admit that in most cases, in, in pre-calc and calculus classes, most of the time your del delta quadratic, it's a fairly friendly one that can factor easily. We shouldn't assume it will be in every single case. But let's, let's start by assuming that we've that this will factor. 5 cosine x, 1 cosine x go here. Luckily, since 5 is a prime number, there's only one way it can break up, 5 and 1, right? And the other good news is that this 3 here, that's also a prime. So it can only break up, it can either be 1 and 3 in that um, position, or it could also be 3 and 1. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and tell you that, again, I'll, I'll let you sort of deal with the quadratics in the way you're comfortable with. And if you're not, of course, come, come see me. But I'll go ahead and say that's a 3 here and a 1 here. And since it's a plus 2 cosine x, that means I'm going to have a plus here and a minus here. And again, you may have your own individual way of breaking that up, but I hope you'll at least look at that and agree that I have factored that correctly. And then that factored equation is what yields two simpler equations. 5 cosine x minus 3 can equal 0. That's, that factor can equal 0, or this other factor can equal 0. 1 cosine x plus 1. Okay, so I've chosen a, what I'll call a, a medium level example here. It's not the easiest one I could have done, but um, it does present us something here that you uh, uh, may or may not be comfortable dealing with. I've got one equation here that's going to give me something that you should be comfortable dealing with. This one gives me cosine x equals negative 1, and, and we should be pretty good at that by now. But this other one here is going to give me cosine x equals 3 fifths. And you have all the tools for that, but you still may be a little bit uncomfortable dealing with that, so we'll, we'll break it down here. Let's do the easy one first. Cosine x equals negative 1. That's just unit circle, right? So cosine x equals negative 1, we should know fairly quickly that that means x equals pi, if that equation is true. Now for cosine x equals 3 fifths, I should remember that the, the easy thing to do is just to do inverse cosine of both sides and get our one solution. But let's remember that there are really two solutions within the interval of 0 to 2 pi. Uh, one of them looks kind of like this, 3 5, but we should remember there's one down here in the fourth quadrant, right? That's also going to give me a cosine of 3 over 5. So let's remember that uh, the inverse cosine of 3 fifths, and I'm kind of glossing over that. We've been through the chapter on, on inverse trig, so if you're really still kind of stuck on that, you really need to get help from either me or someone else who knows what they're doing. We should remember, though, that inverse cosine of 3 fifths will land me here in the first quadrant. And as far as getting this, um, that's the positive angle that goes in this direction. Now, this, this, this uh, other angle, your, your first instinct might be to say that's negative cosine, inverse cosine of 3 fifths. And while to some degree that is true, we should remember that we are asked to find um, solutions on the interval from 0 to 2 pi. Remember way back up here, 0 to 2 pi, right? So we're not allowed to have negative uh, solutions. So what do we do about that? Well, I take that negative angle and I go back around in the positive direction, one full spin, one full rotation. And that's what's going to um, result in me adding 2 pi here. So again, the inverse cosine, I put a negative in front. That gives me the angle that I want. I add the 2 pi to give me the positive coterminal angle, the first positive coterminal angle. And again, if this all sounds like gibberish, please come address it very quickly in office hours. 
And since I'm putting a box around that, I guess I really should be a little more formal about it and saying x equals that angle, or x equals this angle. Okay, that's a little sloppy of me, but hopefully you'll forgive me for that. Those are my three solutions for x. Pi, inverse cosine three-fifths, and negative inverse cosine three-fifths plus two pi. Now, I hope you understand we're not quite completely done. You know why? Because we still need to check. There still may be an extraneous solution, or maybe we just made a mistake. So, uh, you should still type the original equation. You should still type both sides of the original equation into your calculator. Don't be lazy about this. And ensure that there are one, two, three solutions, and yes, if you trace to each of those solutions that we think we solved, we would confirm that those are uh, intersection points and we have correctly solved this. Okay, so diligently do that last step. Uh, you at least want to know if you've made a mistake. All right, that is our first example. Let's go on to our second example. All right, the instructions are the same. Solve this equation in front of us on the interval from 0 to 2 pi. And once again, the general advice I gave in the last uh, example is the same, that whenever you see an x over 2 here, when it's intermingled with just regular old x's, whenever you see that, you should address the x over 2 right away. Um, same advice I've given with double angles. If you ever saw a 2x in this position, you would, address, you would apply the double angle identity right away. Same thing with half angle. But in this case, we do have a question to ask ourselves. Tangent has three different versions of the half angle, and they're all valid. Technically, all three could work, but you should never have this be a random choice. You should never just pick one without knowing why you're picking it. There should always be an intelligent reason, one that's going to make your job a little bit easier. And how do we know which of these three to substitute in? Well, we look to the other side of the equation. We look at what's going on over here. And let's go ahead and do one small step over there on the right side. Let's go ahead and rewrite that. You could probably anticipate what I'm doing. Cosecant x, I could rewrite as 1 over sine x. And in fact, when I look at that, I could just rewrite that as 3 over sine x, right? That could just be 3 over sine x. So that's actually what I'm going to do. I'm going to erase that and say that 3 times cosecant of x is the same as 3 divided by its reciprocal sine x. And now I look at my choices for half angle identities and, I, and my choice becomes clear. I'm going to pick the one that has the same denominator. Uh, we know that having common denominator for adding and subtracting fractions is generally advantageous. Um, so let's go ahead and pick that second one. Now, try to avoid that silly error. Just because the book says 1 minus cosine u over sine u, our variable in question here is x. So let's do 1 minus cosine x over sine x. And let's not forget this 2 out here in front either. So these identities have done its job. We've, we've made our selection, so I'll get that off the screen. I'll remind you that the 2 in front, that gets, get, that gets distributed only to the top. It does not get distributed to the bottom. And for that reason, if you would find it beneficial, you may choose to write that 2 in front as the fraction, as 2 over 1, to really just underscore the fact that, it, uh, uh, that the 2 only affects the top. Okay, uh, I've made a big deal in class, presumably, about not being able to divide out variable terms in these equations. Um, however, I'm going to make the claim here that we can multiply out a variable term. And I'm not going to go in depth over that explanation, but if you don't see the distinction between what we can and can't do with uh, uh, fractions in an equation, um, please ask. Again, I've said you can't divide out variable terms, but what I'm going to do here is I am going to multiply out that denominator. And I'm going to make the claim that that is a legal thing to do. If I was willing to let this video go on endlessly, I, I really would like for every student to know why this is, but I'm going to save that for another discussion. I am allowed to multiply both sides by sine of x, and that will effectively cancel out the sine x on the right side and on the left side. And that will reduce my equation down to, um, well, let's make sure we distribute that too. 
it'll bring my equation down to just 2 minus 2 cosine x equals 3. Let's go ahead and shuffle these around a little bit. Several different ways you could go about this. Um, I guess I'll subtract 2 from both sides and get negative 2 cosine x equals positive 1. And then I'll divide both sides by negative 2 and get cosine x equals negative 1 half. And I know on my unit circle that that's going to give me two special angles over here in the second and third quadrants. That's going to give me my 2 pi over 3, and that's going to give me my 4 pi over 3. Those are my two solutions, so I'll put equals x, put a box around it. I'll put equals x, put a box around it. And I'm putting a box around it. Of course, I'm not really done until I check it. But I am claiming that these are the two solutions I've got. So let's go ahead and check. Okay, once again, just to save a little bit of time, I've gone ahead and done the checking, um, done all the calculator work ahead of time. I assume this all looks familiar to you. There we go. I've got my original equation. You always check the original equation. Got that typed in for y1 and y2. And I confirm that the two solutions that I uh, claimed are indeed the intersection points here on the graph. Um, you may have a little trouble um, just graphically or visually convincing yourself that, the, that there are no more solutions. Um, I'll leave it up to you uh, to determine or convince yourself that these will not intersect again. Um, and of course, if you have any question on how one would conclude that, come see me. All right, but I hope uh, the process overall is making sense here for half angle identities. Let's go ahead and uh, have you take a shot, Adam. Here are a couple for you to try. You know the drill, pause the video. I'll show the answers here in just a moment. All right, let's see the solution for the first one, part A. I went ahead and worked the process out here. Again, the fact that in this one, the fact that that square is being, um, or that the right side is being squared, or has a, has a factor being squared there is good news for us. I'm going to just kind of quickly scroll through the algebra here, pretty similar to how I did the example. Um, kind of like the example, we have um, one factor that gives us non-special angles, and one factor that gives us some special angles. So there they are. I'm claiming that my solutions are here here. Again, there's that plus 2 pi for a reason similar to what was shown in the example. And then the special angles pi over 3 and 5 pi over 3. Those are my solutions, verified graphically here. All right, let's go to part B here. There's part B is a little bit quicker. Uh, again, I used my um, half angle identity. I chose the three different versions of the three different versions for a uh, half angle tangent. Based on that denominator, I chose this version here. Did a little bit of algebra, did a little bit of math here. Got two special angles in this case. And went ahead and, um, so again, I'm claiming that these are the final solutions. And just to be sure before we call it quits, Scroll on down and confirm that, yes, indeed, those are the two intersection points. There you have it, half-angle identities.